I did not sleep well that night. Toby tossed and turned, and I, tethered to the end of his bed by inertia, allowed myself to be rolled this way and that until shortly before dawn when he sat up and whispered in the dark, Harold, are you awake? Not waiting for an answer, he climbed out from under his covers and wrapped himself around me in a full body hug. I had bad dreams, boy, he said in a hushed tone. Did I tell you that movie we saw last night when we went to the last show at the theater? Dracula? Not the new one we saw the time we found Benicula, but the old one with Bella Lugosi. It wasn't even in color and the special effects were totally lame. I didn't think it was scary at all when I was watching it, but boy, Harold, it sure was scary in my dreams. I looked him in the eye and panted to let him know I understood. Ah, you understand me, don't you, boy, he said. Works every time. I'll tell you one more thing, Harold, he said, yawning. You better stay out of Mom and Dad's way today. They're pretty bummed out about this theater thing, losing the battle and all. You know what's going to happen on Tuesday? Boom! They're coming in with a wrecking ball and down it goes. He yawned again. Well, I'm going to try to get more sleep. What are you going to do? He ruffled the hair on top of my head, then crawled back under the covers. And before I'd had time to find out if his question was multiple choice or essay, he was sound asleep. Looking out the window, I could see that the sky was beginning to grow light. Benicula, whose sleeping and waking hours were at odds with everyone else's in the house, would be going to sleep soon for the day, and that meant it was time for his old buddy Harold to sing him a lullaby. As quietly as I could, I removed myself from Toby's bed, stretched out my aching muscles, and lumbered down the stairs. On first encountering the familiar scene in the living room, I felt immensely reassured. Benicula was in his cage. Chester was curled up in his armchair. Howie Light sprawled under the coffee table. Each was in his proper place. Serenity was spread over the room like cream cheese on a bagel. Now for those of you who haven't read my first book, Benicula, the idea of my singing a lullaby to my little furry friend in the language of his native land, a remote area of the Carpathian Mountains region, may strike you as peculiar. For those of you who have read the book, the idea probably strikes you as just as peculiar, but at least you've been warned. You see, soon after Benicula's arrival in our home, I discovered that this particular lullaby soothes him, and so I have sung it to him regularly ever since. Roughly translated, it goes something like this. The sheep are in the meadow, the goats are on the roof, in the parlor are the peasants, in the pudding is the proof. Dance on the straw, and laugh at the moon, night is heavy on your eyes, and morning will come soon. So sleep, little baby, there's nothing you should fear with garlic at the window, and your mama always near. Admittedly, it sounds better in the original. I only regret that I cannot record the melody here, for there is a wistful melancholia about it that would touch you, I'm certain, as it touches me when I croon it in my throaty baritone. And I know it touches Benicula as it carries him off to dreamland. On this occasion, however, I noted a new response on Benicula's part, one that struck me as curious and, under the circumstances, somewhat alarming. Do rabbits cry? I asked Chester after Benicula had fallen asleep. Chester had roused himself from his night's slumber and was in the middle of doing that stretch that cats do, you know, where they extend their front paws out on the floor in front of them as if they're praying, and raise their rear ends up high like they're just waiting for the whole world to notice and say, hey, that's some nice tush you got there. I explained that as I was singing the lullaby to Benicula, the same one I pointed out that I'd sung him many times before, tears were rolling down his fuzzy little cheeks. Rabbits don't have a sentimental bone in their bodies, Chester said, dismissing the whole thing categorically. Especially vampire rabbits. And with that, he marched into the kitchen for breakfast. End of discussion. I glanced out the window. The sky was gray, and a misty rain was beginning to fall. The perfect sort of day for serious napping, I thought, and that was exactly how I'd intended to spend it. And that was exactly how I was spending it until some time later when I heard Chester's voice buzzing in my ear like a dat. Harold! Harold! He buzzed. I know you're in there, Harold. What next? I thought. We've got you surrounded. Okay, fine, he went on. It takes you time to open your eyes, I know that. I wouldn't want you to strain yourself, have a heart attack or something from the effort of pushing up your eyelids too quickly, so just listen. Do I bite him now or later? I've got it all figured out, Harold. He does, Uncle Harold. He really does. Oh, joy, the junior detective is also on the scene. Howie, let me handle this, will you? Chester said. Sure, Pop. I began to snore. Stop trying to pretend you're asleep, Harold. Chester pressed on relentlessly. Okay, here's my theory. 
First, when was it that Benicula started acting frisky and playful, and when, not so coincidentally, did he start his most recent assault on vegetables? Right after Mr. and Mrs. Monroe received calls from their mothers, that's when. Now, when did everything change? Two weeks later, on Mother's Day, Harold. When he heard that the other mothers were coming, he must have gotten it into his little hair brain that his long-lost mother might be coming on Mother's Day, too. And when she didn't, well, it was down in the dumps for our little furry friend, wasn't it? I'll bet he thinks she doesn't love him anymore, Howie chimed in. And you know what they say, you're no bunny till some bunny loves you. Fascinating. I could actually hear Chester gritting his teeth. What more evidence do you need, Harold? Think about it. He cried when you sang him that silly lullaby. Cried, Harold. He misses his mother, but that's not the half of it. He has plans, Harold, I'm sure of it. And some of those tears were because his plans were not fulfilled. Come on, let's go. I know that you know uh, that I know. I know that you know that I know what must be done. Slowly, I raised my eyelids. Do you talk that way just to drive me crazy? I asked, or do you actually think in sentences like that? If there is any chance Benicula's mother has returned, we have got to get to her before he does, Chester said. Before he does, Howie echoed. It can't all be coincidence, Harold. Just think about it. Mother's Day? And what movie was playing at the theater? Dracula, Harold. I looked at the two of them. I looked out the window. I thought back to Chester's description of Benicula's half-finished attacks on the vegetables, as if it were a sport. Maybe he was celebrating in his own way the possibility of being reunited with his mother. There was some logic to that. But it's raining, I pointed out. So, said Chester, you're waterproof. If Benicula's mother is out there, who knows how many more vampire rabbits are on the loose. Okay, okay, I'll go with you, I said. Just give me a minute to look for my mind, will you? I seem to have lost it. Luckily, at least luckily for Chester and Howie, the Monroes were all in other parts of the house, so they didn't see us sneaking out the pet door into the rain. This is so cool, Howie yipped excitedly as we rounded the corner at the end of the block. It's just like Flesh Crawlers, number 24, and my parents are aliens from the planet Zorg. See, there's this girl named Tiffany Sue Tribellini, and she's trying to find her mother because the person she thinks is her mother is really an alien. Now, how the girl knows is that every time her mother goes near the microwave, she glows, which is not your normal mother thing to do. So one day, will you two get a move on? Chester scolded. Chester, I shouted back, do you have a clue where you're leading us? More than a clue. We're going to the last place Benicula saw his mother and where I believe we will now find her, waiting for her sunny boy, the movie theater. Oh, goody, Howie cried out. Can we get popcorn? Can I sit in the aisle? Will there be coming attractions? I didn't have the heart to tell Howie that we weren't actually going to see a movie. As it turned out, we never even got to the theater. With the disaster that would soon befall us, I couldn't help thinking I'd been right in the first place. It was a perfect day for napping.